Would you all please rise and read the scripture with me? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Please be seated. I found, uh, y'all remember Joseph Oedema, the guy that played the, he posted this the other day, and I thought, man, if that doesn't speak about the Christian life, I don't know what does. I can tell you guys all day long about Jesus, and you need to be saved, and all of those things. I can tell anybody that. But if you don't know you're a slave to sin, if you don't know what's wrong with you, you sure aren't looking for any help, are you? I mean, that's kind of the situation. So our, uh, our scripture today and my subject today is, is, is one that is complicated to say the least. But um, my point for doing it is people have doubts about their salvation. And I got a, a preacher friend of mine that runs a bunch of ministries that... Um, He's an old retired Baptist preacher, and, he, and, he, and there's something that he says in one of his, often he uses a common, a lot of times he'll use these words. He says, do you know that you know that you know? In other words, are you 100% sure of your salvation? Are you 100% sure that, that you have done the things that God has called you? I mean, are you living in that, in that realm, or do you have a lot of doubts? And so that, that's, I, just, I like the fact that I can say that I know that I know that I know. Very simple thing. And so um, let's just have a quick prayer and we'll get started. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its meaning and its promises. And we thank you for the fact that you pretty much lay things out pretty simple for even an old country boy to be able to understand. And I, and I greatly appreciate that. You call people like fishermen, like James and John, who didn't have a theological education to go and share the gospel and to change lives and hearts and minds. And I just, I know that that's the way I understand scripture at the very most simple and basic level. And that's what the message came from today. Lord, help my words to be your words and help your wisdom to guide me as I speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about baptism. And it's a complicated, well, let me back up. It's a very simple subject. But we tend in religion to make it very complicated. And I've got about 19 pages of notes and nine scriptures and I don't know what direction I'm going to go first, and we're just going to hang on and see what happens. But um, let's start with just the basic meaning of baptism. Um, in the original Greek, it literally means to immerse, dunk under the water. And, and we have, through the years, done all kinds of variations of that. And, and the way I would like for you to think about that is, have you ever heard, and this applies in the work world, Got the baptism, baptism of fire. You get into a situation at work and it's real difficult, and it's all uh, your whole world's falling apart. And they say, "Man, they baptize you with fire because it all came upon you at once." But that's the idea of baptism. It's this idea of immersion into a whole new life, a whole new way of being, and and it, and it, and it, and it, and it doesn't save you. And we'll get into all that in a minute. Um, but there's a lot. There's a whole lot of scriptures. Actually, I've got nine of them. That, uh, that are involved. You've already heard the first one. Go ahead and switch slides, sweetie. And Jesus does not ask us to do very many things. But there are two things that he asks us to do that are, uh, that are, I guess you'd say, highly debated on what that looks like. And the most amazing thing is, is they're so simple. They're so very simple. We make them so complicated. A newborn baby needs to be clean and he needs to be fed. And so we have the tub and the table. We have baptism and we have food to grow on. And this, this speaks to, yes, our external life, we get that, but more than anything it speaks to our spiritual life. In other words, we are we need to be washed clean and we need to be fed by Jesus. And there are a lot of folks that stop with the wash clean and don't continue down the path. They don't, they don't 
I mean, yeah, they do at some level, but they don't really follow the whole the whole process, I guess you would say. And and that's where I get frustrated because the Bible is very simple about these things. And I'm not here to to pick on denominations or whatever, because boy, if you want to read the differences across the denominations, it'll drive you crazy because everybody has an opinion on it. But but what I want to talk about is the history of the church, how we got the different some of the different versions, just real quick, and then why. And so there are a couple of beliefs, and, and, and one of them is the idea of children's baptism. And I'll tell you as best as I understand it as a redneck pastor where that came from. In the Old Covenant, under Abraham, a, a male child was circumcised, and that is what brought him into the kingdom. Okay, That was what shared him in God's promises. That was the seal that signed, this is a child of God, and he is a direct descendant from Abraham, and, and he is... This is the, the the circumcision was the way that the child was marked as God's child. Okay, first of all, that is male only, and there's no females, which is totally goes away from the idea of what we do in baptism. Now that the Methodist Church teaches uh, a version of that, and we'll and we'll get to that in a second. But then there's another group that says that. Believer's baptism is the way. And if you, every place in scripture that I've ever read about baptism, it talks about the idea of being baptized once you believe. And so that's, that's another, a whole other, and, 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 and I'll, I'll very just a second here, and I'll talk about how the baptism is done. Um, they found about 500 new, uh, I call them New Testament churches from the first century. And the one common thing in all those churches is they had a baptistry. It was four or five feet deep. Okay? So there was a reason for that. That's number one. Number two, this is a humorous one. The word bapto, which is in the Greek, the Orthodox Greek church, who understands Greek real well, has always baptized by immersion. So those are just some of the things that these are just some, some facts. I'm just giving you facts. You, you you are here to make your own discernment about what, what all that means. But the reason these different variations came to be, number one, what do you do with a child who was born into a household that they're believers? And you pray for them, and you raise them in God's word, and you take them to church, and you do all these things for them. Well, you've got to recognize them some kind of way. And there's this circumcision thing in the Old Testament that says, they're born into it, so they're part of it. Well, that's not what the New Testament says anywhere. In no place does it say that. There's one example of a household that got baptized, but nowhere in there does it say there was any infants in the household. And that's a real stretch to start putting words in there that are not there. So that, that's kind of my place on this. But, so, but what happens is, you have people who do children's baptisms struggle because they're looking for a way to recognize personal faith because the Bible says you should have personal faith before you're baptized. So you end up having confirmation classes in our world to give them some training in their personal faith. And I kind of get that. The other way around is the people who do believers baptism struggle because they also want to recognize children so they come up and start doing dedications. So that this child is dedicated to the church and. And then, so that these are some of the things that you get into with this argument. And I'm not a theologian, never will be. I just read the Bible and tell you what it says as far as I understand it. And so those are some of the things we need to think about. But the, the, nowhere in Scripture does God say that we should baptize infants. And, but it has been a practice since the beginning of the church. I mean, very early, I'm not going to say day one, but it, in the early centuries it was a practice. So, my deal is, here, here's my beliefs. Um, the Old Covenant included, his, God included his people by birth through the descendants of Abraham. In the New Covenant, which is how we all get there, I mean, I do have some Jewish people in the house, I don't know if you knew that. They could probably cheat a little bit and go both ways. But, but anyway, um, but the New Covenant says that God included all people through faith in Jesus Christ which requires rebirth. So, so you, you, there is a birth involved, but it's a spiritual rebirth. 
And after that spiritual rebirth, there is a baptism. Because scripture says as I do it. You can read that scripture right there, and there's many others. And we'll get into all that. But we are related to Christ by our rebirth and by our um, transformation and acknowledging that we love Christ and we and we're gonna and we have no physical descendants related to him. But um let's see how many of this I've covered. I went through most of it in a hurry. Um but let's get back to a little bit to this idea of doing. Um, Jesus has a lot to say about what to do on the table. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And he talks about this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So the teaching comes after the rebirth, right? The part that I like, or the part that, that I think makes adult baptism, uh, believer's baptism so important is in every situation where the baptism is mentioned in Scripture, there is repentance, then there's baptism, and then guess what happens next? You get the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you don't get the power of the Holy Spirit if you don't baptize, but it just says that over and over again. You do these three things, and it happens like that. So I don't want to miss that. You know what I mean? Because that is how you battle in this world. That's how you survive. That's how you live through what we go through every day. And so there are many, many scriptures, but I've got about nine of them here, and uh, I'll see where I'm going to start. Um, let's start with being divided over such things as this. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received you. What this is saying is, as a church, we cannot be divided over how someone is baptized. We can't be divided over how someone takes the Lord's Supper. There are some things that we have to be divided over. There are some things that are absolutely dead set critical that we, we must never veer away from, like there's only one way to God, through Jesus Christ. That's a very good example. There are some things that we can, in other words, who are we going to accept into our church? Who are we going to allow? I don't care if they were sprinkled or not. I was sprinkled. It, that, that's irrelevant. I don't care if they took communion by intention and did a different thing. It, none of that matters. Those are things that we cannot get bound up in and, and, and worry about those kind of things. But I'm just giving you some, some facts. Now, the uh, one of my favorite scriptures that has to do with whether or not we should make this right choice Starts with John 3.16, but people don't read the rest of the story. They want to read John 3.17 too, but they don't want to read all the way through John 3.21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank God for that. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds which should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that he may have, be, have done by be, that, that they may have been done in God. There's this idea that you have to accept the light or dark, make a choice, choose a path. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 says, it talks to us about having an obedient life. That's why I believe that baptism is an obedience thing. It's a loyalty thing. It's a I trust God thing. It's a, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm obedient. I'm not doing this because I'm going to get saved. I'm not being baptized because I'm going to get saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm doing this because I want to be obedient to Christ. And so 2 Corinthians 10, through 3 through 6 says, For though they walk in the flesh, we do not war again according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That's a lot of words. But basically, we shouldn't teach things that are disobedient to what the Bible says. And we shouldn't lift those things up and praise them. I, you know, um, one of the things that, that we should all be is a good apologist. We should be able to, to tell the gospel story and explain why it's important. And we should be able to explain those things. And I struggle with 
when, and as a matter of fact, me and I won't pick on David, we talked about this uh, before. Uh, Baptist preachers will wear you out because you have to be baptized as a believer, and I get it. Methodist preachers will wear you out for not believing that the one baptism counts, the baby baptism. So they both got their place where they stand. They will not, and then they do not believe in rebaptism in their, under any form or fashion. I'm just, I'm just giving you two opposing sides, and that's and that's just two views. If I went down the line, you'd go, what? Because the, everybody's all over the map. I mean, the maps are, I mean, it's very blurry. And so we need to understand, like I said earlier, we're not here trying to divide the church. That's not the point. My point is to be obedient to God. I mean, that is by far my most important point. One of the things that uh, we, we, we need to understand about the gospel message and how people want to make it make sense is that 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, who, to us who are being saved it is the power of God. We have to understand that. We have to take that to heart. So some of the things that we do out of obedience look crazy to other people. And then why are you getting dunked? What is that going to do for you? Well, there's a whole reason why it's going to do those things for you. But as we go forward after I get back from my trip in the next two weeks, we're going to give some examples of things that happened. And you already know these examples. You already know about the Ethiopian that got baptized in the middle of the desert. You already know about the thief on the cross who did not get baptized and he went to heaven. You know all these things if you studied the Bible. But what I want to talk about just briefly is the very first time this situation ever came up that the church service closed and somebody needed to be baptized was when Peter was preaching in Acts 2, 38 and 39. They're like, 3,000 people got saved that day, so what do we do next? And here's what Peter says. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So here's the first day, first church service, first every time anybody ever preached on this, first time somebody got baptized after church immediately. It was immediately, by the way. They didn't have classes about whether we should be baptized. They didn't have a baptism Sunday like I did where it's parked way out there. It was pretty much in those days, you got done, we got wet. End of story. Immediately. That was how it was handled. Now, if you want to go back to the history of it, the Jewish people did a baptism a little differently. Uh, I'd call it a washing, a ceremonial washing. They would go get in the river. And if they made some sin that had made them ceremonially unclean, they'd get in the river. And when they come up out of the river, they were clean of that. In other words, they were able to go to church. They were able to go do the things that they do. They were able to operate and live in the society as they were called to live. But that was a regular occurrence. We're not talking about a regular occurrence. We're talking about a one-time-for-all kind of occurrence. And that's what the baptism is about in this situation. Because God is the one who baptizes you and saves you. So... I'm just going to cover everything that I want to cover before we jump in. Uh, Romans 6, we'll get to that in a second, which is probably the most important scripture on baptism. And this one's just one of those we need to understand. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For grace you have been saved through faith, but not of yourselves, and as gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Baptism should not be a checklist item. In other words, okay, I went to church, I walked down and I said the sinner's prayer, I got baptized, I joined the church, none of that matters, folks. The checklist, God doesn't do works. Your salvation has nothing to do with your works whatsoever. So just throw the checklist out the window, it's gone, okay? So let's get back to the, the meat of what's going on here. Um, let me see what I want to share. Okay. Okay. I'll give you an example that I often give around Christmas. The Catholic Church venerates Mary. They think the world of Mary. And because of that, we don't like to do that. But Mary deserves a lot of respect because she was the mother of Jesus Christ. And she accepted the call that God put on her life. 
So we're not real. We want to. We don't want to be worshiping her. And no, we're not going to. But that don't mean we need to dodge her. It's kind of the same thing with baptism. We know that baptism does not save us. We understand that. But it's no less important because God called us to do it. We, we can't say, ooh, it doesn't matter. We, we can't become indifferent about baptism. It is so very important that we understand that it is God's command that we would be obedient to do that. It, it, there's more to it. I mean, we need to understand that it, it is the completion of a process that God wants us to be obedient to. End of story. And, and, it, and it's just, it's, it's worth, it has more value than people give it. So we talked about this idea of the tub and the table. And God speaks, here's the thing we have to understand. God speaks three things to us in baptism. We speak three things to God in baptism. So there's, there's a two-part thing. Number one, he tells us that we are washed clean. Got that? He tells us we're washed clean. Number two, he tells us you have died and you are a new creation. You got that? And number three, you're a new creation and you're alive again. You get that? Let's go to Romans real quick. That's where the scripture comes from. It's the best scripture in all, all of the uh, Romans 6, 3 through 7. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for we have died and been freed from sin. So that's, that's probably the most important thought you'll ever take away from this, is that you have to believe. So here, those three things. You're washed clean. God tells you you're washed clean. He tells you you've died. And he tells you you're born again. So what are the three things we say to God after we're baptized? I have been washed. I believe I have died. And I believe I have born again. That's what you tell God. That's what baptism is about. It's, it's, it's basically just admitting and saying, God, I love you and I thank you and I'm obedient to you. And thank you for washing me. I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to change. I'm going to be a new person. I'm going to be who you call me to be. And when I struggle with those doubts, which people do, I can say, you know what? I was baptized into being God's child. Very simple stuff. Very, very basic, simple stuff. So when I think about that, it's just, it's hard to fathom. So, baptism strictly seals us, who, seals who we are in Christ. It tells us that we know, that we know, that we know. That's all it does. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that everybody needs to get wet. It's not what I'm saying. I'm comfortable with wherever you're comfortable at. I'm just saying that it is what the good book says, and it's very simple. You know, like, like I prayed earlier, God called James and John, who were fishermen, to share the gospel. They were not theologians. They were fishermen. He, but he knew they knew how to catch something. I give him that. And he knew they were hard workers. And he knew they were obedient. That's really all he needed to know. Besides the fact they have the right heart. And so the scriptures are not complicated. Man has made religion complicated. And, and anytime God does not speak a lot about something, I try not to make it up. You know, it's kind of, just because I want it to be in there, you know, we, we've, talked, we've talked about suicide recently. There's almost no words in the whole Bible about suicide. But yet people want to make up stuff that it says this about that. And I'm like, show it to me. And show it to me more than once. Because if God really cared about you hearing a message about something, he's going to show it to you over and over and over again. And believe me, the baptism thing, it's in there over and over and over again. So we, we need to think about those kind of things when we look at Scripture. Don't take one little half of a verse out of context and try to make it fit what your, whatever an agenda might be. Just, just look at what the words say. I'm going to close now. can't believe I got all that done real quick. I was worried I'd be chasing rabbits for two hours because it is that kind of hard thing to share. But it's so simple. 
I guess does anybody I'm gonna be very I'm gonna be crazy. Does anybody even have a question that they want to ask? I mean, because this is the time. We're friends. We can anybody a question you want to ask? Anybody? Don't be scared. Robert asked something, you always talk. To <laughs> I mean it's uh it's so simple and it's and it and it, it is just being obedient to Christ. So I'm going to close then. I'm just going to close. It's very simple. You're either washed or you're not. The person you once were has either died or are you still living the way you used to live. The Holy Spirit either lives in you or it does not. Either you have believed and received Christ or you have not. If any of these things are true, or if all of these things are true in your life, why wouldn't you want to trust God to be baptized? Okay? If all those things are true. And if they are not true, why wouldn't you want to come to know Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. Let us pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the examples of Scripture. They're pretty simple. We just like to make things complicated because we can I thank you for for the fact that you share your word so simply to us. We don't have to look far. We see all kinds of examples in Scripture of people who struggled with who they were, struggled with doubts. The woman at the well, she doubted that she could be redeemable by anyone. And Jesus just told her, hey, I understand where you're at. I understand what you've done. But go and sin no more. And that's, that's, that is the, the ultimate example of the Christian life. You come from a place of, of hurt and heartache and trouble and sin and darkness and you move to a place of redemption and restoration. And baptism is the ultimate sign of, hey, I'm clean and I'm on God's team. Lord, I ask if there's any here today that don't know you or are afraid of, for whatever reason, got any kind of doubts, I ask that you work on them through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you draw them to yourself, draw them to the church, draw them to the life that you call them to be. And Lord, help them to live for you. Help them to make that decision. Help them to be not afraid to step up and stand out and be who they've been called to be. I thank you, Lord, for the time this morning. I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page number 92.